It's Friday, folks. You know what that means. It's time for another Quick Queries video brought to you by AccessLearningZone.com. I'm your instructor, Richard Rost. Quick Queries are answers to queries about Microsoft Access, and they could be about queries or not. So let's see what we got today. First up is the good old subform syntax for the name of a subform, and this one throws a lot of people. I'll be honest, it threw me too when I was first learning Access. It took me a long time to remember this format, right? If you're in a form and you say Starship F, which is your subform name, dot form, bang Starship ID, all right, then it works. While below, I've got this with all the full the full name of there, forms, form name, field name. So it's just a matter of you got to remember this is the syntax. If you're in the form, right? Let's say you're let's say you're in your order form and you're and you're talking about your order detail subform, right? It'd be order detail subform dot form bang field name so first name ordered id whatever you want okay but you can also always refer to it from the top right and from the top is from the very top the forms collection right forms order form order subform dot form this is the tricky part here that always gets people dot form then bang field name all right and like i said when, when in doubt you can always start from the top and just start with forms okay Here's a couple other videos that'll help you out more with this, how to get a value from a subform, and this one, which is just how to get the value from an open form, okay? And you can see right on this page, I've got the syntax right here. Single form is that, right? Subform is that, it's a bit longer, but again, the dot form is the part that usually throws most people. That's the part I had the most trouble with, okay? Okay, next up, this one doesn't have anything to do with the problem that Ryan here is having. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that the problem was caused because he wasn't closing the table and reopening it. All right. This will happen with forms. It sometimes happens with queries. Whenever you make any changes to something, especially VBA changes in a form or a report, close it and then reopen it. You want to save it, close it, and then open it. Like I say in a lot of my videos. And there's a reason why I say silly things like that. And I repeat them all the time is because they work. I don't know how many hours I've lost and how many hairs I pull out of my head because, you know, I, I would make a VBA change and then switch right back over to the form and then click the button and nothing, nothing happened. I'd go back to the editor and I'd make some changes, come back to the form. Yeah, you got to shut the form down completely and then reload it. Give the events a chance to, you know, run all fresh and it fixes so many problems. And if that doesn't help, close the database and reopen it and see if it works then. All right, but definitely whenever you make any VBA changes, even if it's something tiny and you don't think it's a big deal, save it, close it, open it, and it tends to work, okay? And if then it doesn't work, then you post in the forums and say, hey, I got a problem. <laughs> Next up is a question from Jerry, and he says he's having a hard time finding any job opportunities for access developers in Canada. And um, I, I replied with, yeah, you don't really see a lot of companies posting job one ads specifically for access developers. Uh, the way you're going to get work as an access developer is to go out on your own as a consultant. Hang your shingle and look for work that way. That's what I did. You don't see a lot of companies looking specifically for access developers, mostly because they don't know that access is a good tool that will do what they want. Um, a lot of small businesses and mid-sized businesses can definitely use an access database. They know that they have a need for a database solution. They just don't know that access is the right one for them. I got a whole page where I talk about advice for access consultants. If you're thinking about becoming one or if you are one and you want some, uh, you know, of my advice from 30 years of doing this stuff, because before I, I was a teacher, I was, you know, a full-time access developer too. So, and I also got a video that I did about access jobs. So check those out. Here's another question from Jim. He says, can VBA use to create a PDF to Excel conversion program, whether it's Excel or you want to get the data into access, doesn't really matter. Um, the answer is yes. You can generally, if you can get it, especially as a text format, then you can very easily create a, you know, a, an import routine. But honestly, this is one of those things that I think is a really good job for chat GPT because it can take a PDF and you just basically paste it in there and say, can you, you know, extract the data from this PDF and give it to me in a CSV format, and it will just do it. And while I'm all about 
teaching people how to do things. I mean, that's what I kind of what I do. I love teaching people how to programmatically write stuff and, you know, generate VB code. Sometimes some things are just easier. Just drop it in GPT and say, extract this for me or convert this for me or whatever. I'll honestly do this a lot with, like, I write a lot of Python scripts, but some of the more elaborate ones, you know, I know how to do it in VBA. So I just kind of pseudo code it in VBA and say, I'm trying to do this in Python or in JavaScript or in some other language that I need, but I am not an expert with. And GPT is great at converting one thing to another and converting PDFs to usable data. That's one thing where GPT works really well. All right here, for example, here's a, uh, here's a sales document I've got, right? Just like this. I just dropped this spreadsheet inside of a word document and made a PDF out of it. Okay. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Here's GPT, right? I'm just going to take this guy. We're going to click, drag, and drop. Boop. All right, now it's got the PDF. And I'm just going to say, please extract. Yes, I always say please. Please extract the chart data from this PDF and let me have it in CSV plain text format. Okay, and hit go. And it's going to do its thing. It's going to read the document. And there's your data. Okay. No crazy scripts, no code to write. Just It just does it. So that's one of those things where if you just want a quick, fast, simple solution, just drop it into GPT. It works great. It will also cut through all the mess, too. Like, if you look at the original, I intentionally put some, you know, here's some interesting data, blah, blah, blah. Here's some nuts. It cut through all that and just got the chart data out the center like I asked it for. So that was really nice, too. So pretty, pretty handy tool. Next up, this is a, a comment on one of my Excel videos, but uh, Nimish says, they're running some... An access would be a great video. Yeah, I already made it a while back. It's right here. Watch, always watch my videos to the end, even though you don't want to watch all the, the, the stuff at the end. But I always mention if there's other related videos at the end of a video. Okay, so yeah, you missed it. Sonny says, watching my search button tutorial, he doesn't know why, but it requires him to enter the search value, then a parameter value, then the final result. It seems to only happen once. Generally, this happens if you've got something spelled wrong. Anytime you see an enter parameter value pop up and you're not expecting it, chances are something spelled wrong. So even though it's working, it might be getting the value from the right field, you might have another thing in there that's spelled incorrectly. So double check all your field spellings and go see this video for more information. Next up, this is a comment on my where are the links video. It's this video where I show you how to find the links that I mentioned below the video window on YouTube, which YouTube makes a pretty good job of hiding them for you so you can't easily find them. But uh, True Brew wants to know, how do you do this on a tablet? Well, um, my tablet isn't handy, but I can show you on my phone because the, the Android YouTube app is pretty much the same on both a tablet and on your phone. And you're right, they don't make it easy to find. So here it is on my phone, and I just played one of my videos, and you can see... Right under here is a little more link. It's right below the title. It says more right there. Click on that. And then we'll expand a little bit more into a bigger window, but then you still got to click more again to see the whole thing. And now you'll see all the links and then learn more and the other stuff that I talk about in the video. And yeah, YouTube, come on. You got to make this easier for people to find. It's, it's so tucked away. Even I had a hard time finding it. Okay. All right. Easy speak wants to know if I see comments on past videos. Yeah. Um, new ones that come in, I try to at least read them like as they come in, like every couple days, I'll make sure I check them and I approve them. I have to approve all of them. So new ones that come in now. Yeah, definitely. I, I read them as they come in. I try to reply to them as best I can. If they're good ones, I put them in a quick queries video, but there were a few years there going back where I didn't check comments at all. I just didn't have time. I was really busy. And so you might see some comments from five, six, ten years ago that still have no replies on them. So I'm slowly going back through the old ones. Once in a while, you'll see me do a retro quick queries where I answer ones from seven, eight, ten years ago. So those are, those are always fun to get to. But yes, if it's a new one, 2025, I'm on the ball. I check comments at least once a week. I don't always have time to reply to them. I'll you sometimes just give you a thumbs up, but I, I have read it. This user mentioned something interesting. In my attachments video, I talked about don't put attachments in your database because it leads to database bloat. And um, this person had a great idea. 
Uh, we had to use an attachment once and I create a separate ACCDB file to hold them. That's not a bad idea. If you do want to use attachments, put them in a separate video and then link to the or video. Put them in a separate database. <laughs> I got videos on the mind. And then link to that table. And you can still work with the attachments, but you're not going to bloat your primary database. So that's definitely a good solution. I still don't like storing attachments inside a database because it's not really what databases are, are for as far as access databases go. You're better off just putting the attachments in the file system. But if you absolutely got to do it, that's not a bad idea. Rick Deezer wants to know if it's possible to change all the titles of your message boxes and access at once. Well, if they're all the same thing, you could do a global search and replace in your VBA code. Um, and in the future, if you want to have them all the same thing, you can uh, store them in a global variable. So is it possible? Yes, it depends on how you want to set it up and how you've got it set up. If you don't currently have any titles, then you just have the prompt, and then maybe you know the type, like is it just yes, no, yes, no, cancel that, and you didn't specify a title, that might be a little trickier to do a search and replace for if there are no titles currently. Um, you might have to do them by hand. But once you do that, if you want to have them all the same thing, then I would use a global variable, or a constant even. Shadow Dragon seems to think that the Microsoft Access team has an SQL server mole buried in them trying to get people to intentionally inflate their access databases past the two gigabyte limit. Is it possible? Hmm, I don't know. Theo says he watched my reset database video and he wants to know how he can reset the auto number to something specific. That's what I'm gathering here. I show you how to delete all the data and then by compacting and repairing the database, it'll bring all the auto numbers back to one. He wants to know if you could increment it to a number like 105. Yes, it's possible. Um, you could just add a bunch of blank records and then delete them and then the auto number will be set to whatever you want. But I have to remind you, auto numbers are not for you. You should not care what they are. They could be set to any random number. It wouldn't matter. They're really only for internal database use only for relationships, for making sure records are unique, that kind of stuff. If you want some kind of a number that you control, make your own counter variable, right? In a video like this, I teach you how to make your own sequential numbering. So if you want to, if you keep track of the, you know, the order numbers, for example, you want them to be sequential, this is what you do. Don't use an auto number for that. And there is also a trick where you can replace an auto number if you need to, if you accidentally deleted it. And that has to deal with an append query. So watch this if you need to learn how to do that. But again, auto numbers are not for you. You shouldn't care what they are. Giovanni brings up a good point in my character word substitutions video where I teach you how to take a long text field and substitute things like, you know, uh, characters with umlauts over them with regular low ASCII character ones. Um, and I mentioned you could also probably use it for word substitution, although that was kind of like a unintended side effect. Then I showed how you could do NASA. But Giovanni's right. If you got the word nasal, it will replace it with NASA. So you'd need a little more logic in there to determine if it's a whole word or not. Um, I would envision checking for a space in front of it, or if there's nothing in front of it, like if there's a previous sentence and there's a period or something, you'd have to, you'd have to look for delimiters around the word. So it'd be a little more complicated, but it's definitely doable. But, uh, or just check to make sure there isn't another letter on either side of the word, right? If anything, if anything to the left of the letter, left of NASA is a non-letter, or to the right of the end of NASA is a non-letter, then don't do the sub or it, then the substitution's okay. So it can be a little more complicated, but it's definitely doable. But thanks for for the heads up. I didn't think of that. All right, folks, that's about gonna do it for another quick queries. Hope you learned something. Enjoy your weekend. Live long and prosper, my friends. I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button right now and give me a like. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel, which is completely free. And make sure you click that bell icon and select all to receive notifications whenever I post a new video. Do you need help with your Microsoft Access project? Whether you need a tutor, a consultant, or a developer to build something for you, check out my Access Developer Network. It's a directory I put together personally of Access experts who can help with your project. Visit my website to learn more. Any links or other resources that I mentioned in the video can be found in the description text below the video. Just click on that show more link right there. YouTube's pretty good about hiding that, but it's there. Just look for it.
Now, if you have not yet tried my free Access Level 1 course, check it out now. It covers all the basics of Microsoft Access, including building forms, queries, reports, tables, all that stuff. It's over four hours long. You can find it on my website or my YouTube channel. I'll include a link below you can click on. And did I mention it's completely free? And if you like level one, level two is just $1. That's it. And it's free for members of my YouTube channel at any level. Speaking of memberships, if you're interested in joining my channel, you get all kinds of awesome perks. Silver members get access to all of my extended cut tech help videos, and there's hundreds of them by now. They also get one free beginner class each month, and yes, those are from my full courses. Gold members get the previous perks, plus access to download all of the sample databases that I build in my tech help videos. Plus, you get access to my code vault, where I keep tons of different functions and all kinds of source code that I use. And gold members get one free expert class every month after completing the beginner series. Platinum members get all of the previous perks, plus they get all of my beginner courses, all of them from every subject and you get one free advanced or developer class every month after finishing the expert series. And you can become a diamond sponsor and have your name listed on the sponsor page on my website. So that's it. Once again, my name is Richard Rost. Thank you for watching this video brought to you by accesslearningzone.com. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something today. Live long and prosper, my friends. I'll see you next time.